Welcome back to Tetracan Super Monoblock. This will be the first in maybe a series, maybe it will be one video about this uh, Multi Tracker X24. In this series, I'm just taking it apart, giving you a bit of reconnaissance. So, say you've got one of these, needs the belts changed, need to unsolder, resolder, desolder something, um, something needs cleaned. Whatever your repair issue is, at least you've got some sort of idea of, about where everything is and how it is taken apart and put back together. So, um, assuming we're going to be taking the mixer out for cleaning later on, I need to take some of these knobs off from the front. I'm using the little tool like you use for getting the broken screen off a smartphone, so you can get these for a couple of quid. just doesn't scratch the surface of the multi tracker too much. These four here um, are mounted from the other side of the plastic case, so we leave them alone. Uh, the locations of these holes with red tape beside them all contain the same kind of screw. Just to make this a bit easier, I've already been in here and we've only got two of these in here, but you will need to remove six. These are what those screws look like, so they've got a very short shank, maybe about three centimetres in length. You see I'm using a crosshead screwdriver. Put those off, you can be able to lift this up slightly and then you're going to need to draw it forward a little bit just so these little plastic lips come past the transport button. And if I'd actually replaced any of these screws attaching that, which I forgot to, and it would open up like that, out that away. If at all possible, leave the two halves connected. The way that these connectors work there's a little plastic lip that comes up um, well you can see that that would come up if I continue to force it and then there are little spring loaded connectors that are biting onto each of the metal protrusions from this ribbon cable I want to recommend that you don't take those out I have bad experiences with this kind of connector where it's very difficult to get them to connect again properly and in other occasions where I've removed this kind of connector I've had to resort to crimping on new connectors and soldering in new headers on the boards. Since I haven't actually replaced any of those screws it makes sense to just get this out now. When you're doing this kind of thing you want to distinguish between the holes where the screws coming through from the other side of the plastic case and the ones where the screws go directly into the board. So you can see that this hole here corresponds to this plastic mounting post so I'll put a cross through that so I need to remind myself in reassembly not to put a screw there. Likewise that one. Likewise this one. Yeah so I think that's all of them. So that would leave us with one two, three, four, five locations of screws and the screws that I should have put back in there before starting to film this are like this, sort of brassish in colour, about a centimetre long, they're coming out with the same size of screwdriver. So imagining I remove those five screws, this is going to lift up like this, you can see we've got um, some shielding here, it's common ground connector, it goes onto a pin here, you just lift that up. And uh, that is now separate. The door, if you needed to remove that, there's a leaf spring there that comes out with one screw. With that removed, you would just pinch these two. Um, I can probably just about show you actually. You can see that there's pins on these hinges that go through slots. If you were to replace that, you know, it's going to be in two sections. And the downward angle wants to be pointing down towards the case and that is what prevents this from falling shut. Um, I just filmed this unit, Multi Tracker X14. Presumably I'm gonna publish the videos on that first and I did actually demonstrate the removal of that door. If that's something you need to see. Okay, so with that upper part of the case off, we can just leave that off to the side. And let's focus on getting out this transport so that we can get it belts and that kind of thing. So the magnetic heads we have, record and playback on the right. A race on the left. We can see that that's going into four headers on this record playback amplifier board here, one per channel. The wires going into these connectors are pretty delicate, so you could use pliers. In this case, I'm getting under the lip and catching under an edge like that with a flathead screwdriver, prying the connector out of the header. 
Connector and header basically means plug and socket. Like that. Uh, we can see that there is an earth wire, common ground wire running from the playback record head to a bring connector here. So we're just making sure that that is electrically connected to the chassis, which is then connected by another wire to the rest of the system. I'm about to remove one, two, three, four screws. Well, actually that fourth one isn't in. You see, I've already put a cross through that one. That's because that is another one of these sandwich joints where the two halves of the plastic case join there. So there's no screw to replace there. But I've put two times E. Actually, the Sharpie pens come off a bit, but I'm just reminding myself. And really, it should be three times E. There's another one there. Um, I'm just reminding myself that all these common ground connectors converge in this corner here. So you've got one that's going to the playback record head, one that's going onto this board and this one that's joining to another. That one actually comes off that way as well. So it looks like there's two connectors to this board. I guess that means that the two parts of the circuit board are electrically isolated from each other. And so the chassis of this transport is a sort of junction to make sure that all the parts on the circuit that are common ground are electrically connected to one another. And if I lift that up, you can see more clearly that uh, these various leaf switches and uh, the four wires that are going to this motor all converging one header up at the top. Wires are thick, so I can pull that out. This transport is the same as we've seen in the X14, the Tascam 414, the 414 Mark II, and the Tascam Porter 07. Um, I've mentioned in several other videos, Yamaha, Fostex, Tascam often are getting their transports from the same third party supplier. So it might be the GEC company that made the same transport in the um, X15 and the Porter 1, or maybe it's a, a different contractor. But uh, for belt sizes, refer to my video on the 414 Mark II. I'll just very briefly show you one here from the pulley on the motor to the uppermost pulley of two pulleys on this flywheel. Um, this lower one wraps around the lowermost of pulleys. It's just under here on this flywheel. It goes around this wheel. We've got another one going from the supply reel to this pulley on the mechanical counter. All the other functions of this um, are handled mechanically. So you can see if I press play or rewind, you see when I press rewind there, there's some mechanical movement that's changing how these cogs interact with these reels. These are really just sensors for turning on and off the motor. Briefly mentioned that you can pay a lot for a set of belts like this, but you can get all the belts you need in a multi-pack for a few pounds. That's what I've been doing with this model of transport. You can see we've got a little daughter board with our two um, XLR inputs and some quarter inch jack inputs there. That's connecting to the mixer input amplifier board over here by three connectors. When I removed this before, the plastic on the header came away with the connector. So I wonder if it will happen this time if I grab that pull. Because again, these cables look pretty. Yeah. See that? Really, that, that little bit of black plastic should be staying there around those pins. I mean, the pins are soldered in, so it's not going to screw with the electrical connection, but I would need to go in just little tiny holes in that and push that down over these three protruding pins. Get this out. Yeah, so that's the way it should look. This little plastic guide stuck down to the pins. It just stops you from turning these cables 180 degrees, ending up with a situation where the wrong wire joins the wrong pin. Those three cables out of the way and there's one, two screws. Take that forward slightly, tight squeeze but then that comes out like that. Um, I think you can get at any soldering that you needed to there. There's a transistor, maybe a voltage regulator there. Um, that's what that cable's doing. Um, it's attached to this, so it's using this plate as a heat sink, as well as that screw. It's probably some sort of thermal compound there, of the type that you would use to attach like a CPU to its heat sink. So maybe if you needed to replace that, then you would remove these four screws that are attaching this metal plate to these XLR jacks. So that would give you access to this tiny little daughter board, this transistor on it. You can see it, it terminates on this board and another one of these sort of ribbon connectors. So I'm going to leave that dangling again. Likewise here. So let me 
just put that off to the side there. In terms of getting this board away from the lower part of the plastic case, nice feature on this one is that there is a little clip holding that AC to DC converter input jack in place. That's good because a common fault with these um, portable multi-trackers is that um, the, the solder pads break at the bottom of these because of the force of it constantly being plugged and unplugged. So slotting one of these clips in there just makes that mechanical connection a little bit firmer and a bit less likely to become damaged. We can also see that there's another common ground connector that's going underneath to this piece of shielding here. And then the locations of the screws are two here. One here, here, another one here, another one here. So what's that, six in total? One, two, three, four, five, six. Of those, I've only got two screwed in at the moment, so I'll just remove those quickly. And there we go. That's the electrical guts of it sitting pretty much separate. I mean, I suppose for, um, let's move a couple of things out of the way here testing purposes you could even you know if you needed to um, signal trace you'd probably prop up the cassette player off to the side there connect everything over here plug it in as long as it's on a non-conductive surface and that gives you access to everything you needed Let's say you need to do calibration obviously that won't require that you remove this bottom board just so that you open the case really these uh, blue and white trim pots are what you would be adjusting you be doing that with a ceramic screwdriver because if you use a metal one then that can cause well it can be mean your readings can be off but in some circumstances you can actually short things which is bad but i've got lots of videos on my channel about how to do calibration the pots are labeled well so that's going to be easy enough to follow as far as cleaning this goes Depends on what kind of contact cleaner you've got. Where I live, Surface Hole Super 10 is a lot cheaper than this deoxid stuff, but this strips away the lubricant, so you absolutely have to follow up with lubricant afterwards on things like these pots. Whereas, as long as it's not too dirty, I could probably do this in one step. That would get rid of any crackle or stuff like that. Um, again, I've got much more detailed video showing you the cleaning of a mixer. Have a look at the cleaning and the electronics playlists on my channel splash page. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to show you about this. I don't think there is. Um, I haven't tested the record features but I have tested the playback features and although these two are healthy these ones are a bit weird. This one's very quiet. This one's super loud. Will be a case study video on this channel at some point. Anyway I hope that was helpful and I hope to see you again soon.